Yeah. And of course, most of us have felt the impact of Her Majesty the Queen, but haven't been fortunate enough to know her. Two people who did are with me this morning uh, to discuss what she left us as a as a country and also as a, as a racing nation. Henrietta Knight and Andrew Balding, both of whom trained, trained winners for Her Majesty and knew her well. Uh, David Yates, newsboy from the Daily Mirror alongside me. Um, Hen, the Queen was somebody that you interacted with an awful lot, not just through racing, but also through, also through your, your shared love of all horses, really. I described her as a, an equestrian polymath. That similar comments could, could apply. Yeah, she had a, a great way with animals. Um, she adored her, her dogs, and she adored her ponies, and she adored her racehorses. And she was just a natural. And I think probably her way with animals, that's why she was so brilliant with the country and with her people. She could just be part of the people she inter interacted with. And so there was that, that sort of natural empathy. Not everybody has it, do they? Mm. No, she, it's a gift, and she was gifted. And uh, there's an awful lot, I mean, we've seen over the last 10 days, an awful lot of speculation 24-7 on all the rolling news channels. And you, know, you feel for, for everyone trying to fill all those minutes and hours with, with tributes, um, some of them well-informed, others less so. The idea that the Her Majesty the Queen really did love racing, was no, that, that wasn't a flight of fancy, was it? She, she was completely passionate and completely knowledgeable. Uh, she was passionate about her racing and um, she, she lived for it as well as everything else that she did and all her sense of duty. Racing was her, you know, her, her, let, her let out, really, in a way, because she, she could um, really enter into the spirit of it and she knew so much about it. She was such a knowledgeable lady and she knew everything about the pedigrees and the temperaments and the well-being of all her horses. Brilliant. I mean, Andrew, your family have trained for for the Queen for, well, it's three generations, isn't it? It goes back to goes back to your grandfather. Yes, yeah, my grandfather and obviously Uncle yeah. Willie, he, he had the privilege of training for as well, so, uh, yeah. And for you, when, when you took over, um, was it something that you were very, very conscious of when you, when you first took over the licence, that, you know, there was, there was that lineage there, there was that tradition in the family of training for, for the monarch? Yeah, well, I was extremely lucky, obviously, to to inherit the Queen as, as an owner, and but she was very supportive, and as she was of a, a lot of young people, um, it was a huge privilege to, to have had that opportunity. And that interaction that the, the trainers talk of was sort of instant. Every time, every time a horse ran, it seems that she she didn't miss it. Yeah, m amazing. I mean, she had such a you know desire to see her horses that she'd bred and and um, owned, see them race, obviously, and uh, you know she couldn't see it live. It was recorded, and um, she got a huge, I hope, huge pleasure from most of it anyway. D did it make you nervous? Um, no, you wanted to do well. Y you know, it made, y you know, if you, if you had a long spell without winners, um, it felt put pressure on yourself, but she'd never put pressure on you. Uh, you never felt that way anyway. Um, no, it was it, everyone who, who had the great fortune to train for, I think, w w were totally committed to trying to do their best and I think she appreciated that. But I, I, I like the idea that yes she loved horses but she loved to win as well. She loved, she loved her horses being the best and succeeding and you just see those little glimpses, only in racing would you see those little glimpses of real fire and emotion. Yeah well absolutely I think that racing has that effect on a lot of wealthy and, and powerful people that it is, you know, that, that sense of just because you're the Queen of England doesn't entitle you to, to success on the race course and, and I think she got huge enjoyment and pleasure out of those successes and, and as you say I think it sort of drove a, or appeared to drive a competitive streak in and, um, but uh, she was you know everyone has said what a wonderful she's the best of the best obviously as a, as a human and person but as an owner she was very much the best of the best. I mean Hen you have a, a, a pretty clear insight into, into the frustrations and the heartache of trying to breed good horses. You know, the, the qualities you need to do that and to stick at it are, are, are pretty significant. Very much so. And she was competitive, not only trying to breed the best horses, but also trying to breed the best Highland ponies and Dale's ponies, which she was very fond of as well. And um, I was lucky enough this May to have talked to her for about 20 minutes at the Royal Windsor Horse Show. Mm -hmm. And 
she had a championship there with her Highland pony. And we were watching the judging in the ring and I was talking to her. And she knew every pony in the class. She knew everything about the breeding. And she was really good tea. She was really on edge that she wanted to win this class. She was determined. And, uh, and the Royal Windsor Horse Show was a, a big part of her life, wasn't it? It was her, one of her favourite parts of the calendar. I mean, every May she lived for the, for the Windsor Horse Show and she would always be driven down to the ringside from the castle and watch the classes and all her ponies would be prepared specifically for that day, um, her best ponies, and that she gave her a chance to see them and she just mingled with the crowd and I think that was what was so wonderful about the Queen is that she was a people's person and the people could identify with her and they could talk to her and she wasn't somebody sat, stuck up on a pedestal, unapproachable. She was incredibly approachable and she knew the, the, the ponies and she knew the horses and everybody respected her. And you had a, a close link with her through your own family as well, through your, your late brother-in-law, Sam Vesti, who was master of the horse, Lord Vesti, master of the horse, um, to, whom, to whom she was very close. And so you, you must have seen quite a bit of the, the inner workings of how the whole equestrian side of, uh, of the royal family really worked and hung together. Yes, I suppose I've been very lucky in my life. And um, not only did I know the Queen, but I knew the Queen Mother very well through my parents. Mm -hmm. And... And then, of course, when Sam Vesti was master of the horse for 19 years, he spent a lot of time with her and with my sister. And I, I, I'm just very fortunate to have been so close to such a wonderful lady. Uh, Andrew, you, you were fortunate enough to train some really good horses for the Queen, particularly latterly. And um, it was only May that you, you won the, the Temple Stakes with with King's Lynn. Now, would it be fair to say that this is a horse that, that had been a, a project? He was a very talented horse, but he hadn't always had the rub of the green. How much satisfaction did that give you and the Queen? Well, I hope huge satisfaction for her. It certainly gave me great satisfaction. But um, he, was, he won the big, uh, the big sponsored race up at the Weatherby sponsored race up at Donkster as a two year old and mm -hmm. uh, had been a pretty good three year old and was a bit unlucky in the Wokingham. He was third in the Wokingham and this year obviously stepped up to win at. Uh, the, the group to Haydock, and uh, you know it was a it was a fantastic day, um, and you know he's we still hope he's capable of, of going on and and doing more. It's just it's a great sadness that she won't be here to see it. Do you think this is just the, the tip of the iceberg? Do you think you were you were scratching the surface with this horse, and that there's there's a group one waiting to? Well, hopefully, we'll you know hopefully we'll, time will tell. But he's he's just a really sweet horse, very kind natured and, and he's relatively young with low mileage for a sprinter. But we, we've heard quite a bit in the last seven days about uh, Her Late Majesty's fortitude in defeat. I'd imagine the couple of Royal Ascots tested, tested that, didn't it? <laughs> and yours. Well, <laughs> certainly. Um, the, well, she was, the, the, the Queen was present when he was third in the Wokingham and it was just, as you know, with sprinters you need everything to go right. Um, and he just didn't get a lot of luck. He ran on consecutive days. This was last year at Ascot and was very unlucky in the King stand. Not that he would have won, but he, I think he would have been a good, a good second. And, and then, yeah, unlucky in the working as well. So twice in a week. Uh, Dave, you've been putting together your, your tributes over the course of the week for, for your newspaper, as everybody in our, our industry has. And you used a, a really striking phrase to me to describe her Majesty and horse racing. Just, just remind me your your assessment in a line. I think. I mean, it, in the the mirror, uh, I wrote that uh, Her Majesty the Queen was the single most important person in in the the history of of the British turf. And um, preface that by saying it is no exaggeration to say that uh, she was she she had that status. Um, I was contacted by a few people to say, you know, are you sure you haven't overdone that? But I think that the, the crucial point to make is that particularly, say, over the last two decades, horse race and, and the Queen was an over, owner for 70, mm -hmm. but particularly the last 20 or 30 years, say, horse racing has come under increasing external pressure politically from politicians of all hues. Um, and it's been 
something that I, th I think was actually understated in British racing, that the Queen's role of providing validation for an activity that came under that pressure, a, you know, a family that are politically neutral, mm -hmm. um, that uh, there, there, is, there is no better um, example of that than, than the scenes from the Royal Box watching estimates winning the Gold Cup at Royal Ascot, whereby that is something that obviously the, the, uh, the last of Her Majesty's uh, classic winners Silver Jubilee year 1977. So by the time Estimate was winning the Queen's Vars and then the following year the Gold Cup at Royal Ascot, we lived in a, a, a more, a, a, an age of, well I suppose we had global television in 1977, mm. but certainly I, social I know media. Mean, yeah. where, and that was, that clip was sent absolutely everywhere. And as I say, it's, it's, it, it can't really be overstated that, the, the importance of the reigning monarch of 70 years or close to at that point um, provided that validation to a, a sometimes you know doubting audience as to whether horse racing was to put it bluntly an ethically supportable activity and I think her role in that was absolutely crucial I think the other point that, that I'd like to make is that in in talking to those who who dealt with Her Majesty, uh, you know, Willie Carson was quoted extensively in, in the pieces that I wrote, uh, and, and also Frankie de Tory, Sir Michael Stout. Um, it, it's, it's entirely fitting that the first, the, the first meeting that one uh, has knowledge of with Big Game, the, two, the Royal 2000 Guineas winner, and Her Majesty, I think as a teenager, ran her hand along Big Game's neck at... at um, mm -hmm. Beckhampton. At Beckhampton. And you know, the, the story was that, l like all of us, when we meet our sporting idols, you know, you think, I I'm not going to wash this hand, I've just shaken the hand of whichever footballer or whoever it might be. And that, that, that the, the story, possibly apocryphal, that... that she didn't wash her hand for hours afterwards because it had that it had that smell of the thoroughbred that that bewitches us all when we're close to it, mm. and and that was very significant because when you talk to particularly the the, the the jockeys and the trainers, the the pursuit of glory on the track was it seems secondary to what was going on with the, the the breeding of horses the rearing of young horses the the what what happens behind the scenes in the horses training environment sometimes whereby the the, the pursuit for them to to reach their potential much more than than just lifting a trophy although obviously as we saw with <laughs> estimate that was very important yeah. too all those little yeah, the stifled clenches of the fist were, were very enjoyable to watch there. Uh, Hen, you've got some insight into what Dave was saying as well, particularly in a in a note that Her Majesty wrote to you when you, you wrote to her after the death of Prince Philip. Yes, after... Well, she, I have several treasured letters from the Queen that she wrote to me with her own hand after my sister died and after Sam Vesti died and then after Prince Philip died. And... At the end of the Prince Philip one, it was a letter which obviously was sent out, a letter to a lot of people. She had put about quite a nice paragraph in her own hand, and she'd said at the bottom of it how much comfort she got from animals. Her dogs and her horses had been so great to her. And the, the tribute that John Warren, her racing manager for so many years, paid yesterday when he was talking to the, the PA news agency, he was talking about being with the Queen in, in Balmoral the weekend before she died. And he said, we sat there for hours strategizing and making plans going forward. I think the nicest thing for me to know is that she was surrounded by her family members. She was in such a healthy state of mind and in tremendous form. She really loved having them right there with her and being able to talk about her horses and her love for her horses right to the very end. And of course, uh, the Queen then met 
uh, outgoing Prime Minister Boris Johnson at Balmoral and then announced Liz Truss as his successor the same day. And John Warren said, I left her on Monday afternoon. The Prime Ministers were coming in on Tuesday and she had a winner on the Tuesday. Uh, Clive Cox trained the winner on Tuesday. Uh, on the evening, she was in really good form, delighted she'd had a winner, talked about the Prime Ministers coming in and out. I can hardly believe it possible that within less than 48 hours, the Queen had died. Shocking as that was, it's wonderful to know that she led a long and full life and dutiful to the very end. Perhaps the racing community contributed to giving her some pleasure uh, along the way. Uh, and I guess it's, it's that puzzle, that strategising, Andrew, that thinking about plans for the horses, that's going to keep any mind pretty vital. Yeah, and all, obviously always the, the dream and the hope that you're creating the, the next derby winner. And, um, you know, it's just, to me, it's a, it's a lovely story that to think that these horses, that, that these matings have been designed by the Queen um, so, mm. you know, there is going to be a lasting legacy for the next few years at least. Now, the last paragraph of, of, of John's um, thoughts yesterday really struck a chord. He said, if we'd done our best, uh, if we were able to get the equivalent of a D student, a C grade with best endeavour, that itself was tremendous. Now, Hen, it would be fair to say that you were, you were the recipient of some E or F grade students, just one or two, but deliberately sent yes, to you yes. a sort of problem problem children mm. to see if you could get any kind of grade at all and you did manage with one of them. I did manage with one. We did have a winner for the Queen um, but I used to get the horses that had probably were the, the ones that were as you say right at the bottom needed, of the class. Needed some remedial treatment yeah. And But she never gave up you see she believed in everything and that something could be done with every horse or every pony. You don't just say well that's no good forget about it. Mm -hmm. She always thought what the next horse that was not so good would have to do and as she gave quite a few horses away to be ridden by people and they were ex-race horses that became very good retrained race horses um, like Barber's Shop who did so well in the show ring mm. and um, but she always believed that there was a place for everything and that's why I suppose she thought maybe in my small little yard I could help a few fading lights and see if I could re rejuvenate them so you did manage to you did manage to get one past the post. In we front. did forty to one at Fontwell, much to her surprise. I remember ringing her up, more or less directly after the race, and she'd watched it. She watched nearly every race that she could, and um, well, her even the, the the surprise in her voice was fantastic. <laughs> it was worth it just for the surprise. Harvest song was the the name of the yes, horse. Yes, this harvest song by Sadler's Wells. He was. A sweet horse, but he'd had various problems with his muscles and his back and so on. He tried, but he, he wasn't very talented. And he found life a bit difficult. But I, I bet, even though you appreciated that moment at the time, I bet you appreciate it even more now. Oh, fantastic. And Will Kennedy rode him, and I think he appreciated it. And it was a bit of a fairy story that afternoon. That was Fontwell mm. Park. And I think it was Fontwell Park, Dave, where Her Majesty had her first winner in co-ownership with the the Queen Mother years and years and years ago. I think that's the thing that, another thing that strikes uh, me, I, I think that the the fact that the, in, in John Warren's piece, there is, uh, I think he says that, that, that it was probably estimate that gave Her Majesty mm. the, the, the greatest pleasure. But there's also the talk of the students who needed to stay behind after school for extra lessons. Um, and... I think that he talks of the Queen's approach being akin to a parent wanting their child to win at the Olympics, which, of course, uh, Princess Anne competed mm. in 1976 and, and uh, Zara Phillips in, won a silver in, uh, in 2012. And I think that's a really interesting point, that um, what, what unites us all in horse racing is that we lose our sense of perspective when a horse is running, however small your share in that horse, however modest the prize might be, that when glory arrives, that matters for nothing, does it? The, the fact that you have won, your, your small share has won a modest prize at Fake and Omar. It doesn't have to be Ascot or Epsom or, you know, any of the, the big tracks. And she clearly delighted in that and that's something that that bonds us all isn't it yeah. that mm. when when it comes to 
uh, horse racing sport, but particularly horse racing, that sense of perspective, however studied we might be in anything else that we do, when we get to that, that completely disappears. Now's not the time to, to, to speculate about the future, though, though plenty have. But uh, just touching on Royal Ascot particularly, Andrew, somewhere you, where you've had you know, a tremendous amount of success and you've had an awful lot of runners for Her Majesty the Queen, it's not officially a state occasion. But she made it a state occasion by being there most every day she could in her entire reign, say for the state opening of Parliament and when um, she wasn't terribly well last year. But um, it, that really brought the, the whole event and the whole sport to, to, to a public consciousness that no other event can really. Very much so. I think Certainly on a global scale. Royal Ascot's huge in the Royal Procession is hugely important to, to our sport and, um, you know, it, it also for for members of, of the public, of the, you know, to, to be able to wave a Union Jack once a year and, and sing the national mm -hmm. anthem is, yeah. is important. You know, it's not Jubilee year every year, and I hope that can continue, that sort of tradition of being able to celebrate the, the monarchy and, and being British is, is the most important feature of, uh, of Royal Ascot, and I hope that continues. But I, the, the, the stories are legendary, and I'm sure you will have both experienced this personally, of the fact that if you're there at lunch at Windsor Castle, you've got to be there on time for, for, for 1.59 to make sure that you're not going to miss anything. Mm. I mean, you must, have, you must have experienced that, Andrew. Uh, yes, I was very lucky to go in the, in the carriages, um, and it's an amazing experience and, and yeah, run to military precision, the timing, absolutely. But uh, I, you know, I very much hope that that will continue for, for Ascot and racing sakes, but I think it's probably important for the, well, I hope it, they would deem it important for the monarchy as well. Hen, do you, I, do you I, concur? I, I totally agree. Everything was precision, everything was exact, um, but it was good because it set an example to other people how to behave and how to conduct themselves. Perfect. And I just hope that everything continues, her racing, her racehorses continue, and her, her lovely stud of Highland ponies, that they continue, and that, you know, there's continuity. We all want that. And, of course, the, the continuity came, Dave, because monarchs have had racehorses since, the, well, since Charles II. That's right, and uh, both through, uh, well, King George V had two Derby winners as the, the Prince of Wales. Um, as you say, the, the success then went through uh, King George VI as well, Queen Elizabeth II's father. And so, yeah, it's it's a, uh, um, it's it, it's. It's another fascinating thing. I keep saying it's another fascinating thing, but but when you look at the the pedigrees and you see, like for example, high clear and then high to fashion, and and that's a that's a really interesting and rewarding thing. You know, certainly um, high clear and Dunfermline were both homebred classic winners, and it's I I, I really look forward to the. Um, I, and hope that the royal studs are, uh, are, are kept in in the family ownership, mm -hmm. and that and that um, we can continue to to celebrate those winners for for many years to come. 